Hello, welcome to AT&T Threat Track for July 16, 2013. This program provides network security highlights, discussion, and countermeasures for cyber threats. I am joined today by Jim Quasing and Stan Erlov, and I'm Brian Rexrode. And uh, let's go ahead and talk with Stan first here. And Stan, uh, there's a lot of talk about preventing leaks, and I guess uh, perhaps some new ideas are coming out. Or are they old ideas? <laughs> I think... Uh... I guess a combination of both. You know, what, what, what comes in the future is usually borrowed from the past. Um, Ars Technica has an interesting article. Uh, supposedly a Russian newspaper in Moscow reported that a government agency there is planning to purchase a few typewriters uh, so that, you know, they can keep their secrets uh, from leaking, uh, like WikiLeaks style. Um, I guess it's an interesting idea. Um, I'd have to weigh that against the ability for them to actually be able to share the data that they generate. But if, they, uh, if they've done the proper analysis and if they go through with this, uh, it may be an appropriate option for them. I know some people like the soothing sound of uh, typewriters. <laughs> that soothing sound of typewriters. That, that, you know, it looks like it's at quite a price as well. You know, typewriters used to be pretty cheap, but nowadays you can hardly find one. And uh... It looks like an article there saying up around nearly fifteen thousand dollars for a typewriter. Well, when you sell things to the government, it's never cheap. <laughs> they, they should consider going to someone's garage sale. I think uh, to to find these and at least as, as a proof of concept to see if that's really going to work for them. Because I, you know, I think you have a very good point. The uh, actually sharing the information is an important part of having information. That is, if it's uh, if it doesn't get into the right people's hands, where you can actually make good use of it, it's, uh, it's all it is is, in this case, paperweight. Yes. So uh, <laughs> thanks for bringing that, Stan. I think it's a little bit, uh, it, you know, it's kind of a light opening to the program here and, um, you know, perhaps serious work for some folks. Um, I hope we don't go that way. Um, I just wanted to share something that was, uh, uh, I guess, uh, along the same lines, a little bit light, uh, but it is related to some malware. Um, actually, what is uh, we're still in the mid, you know, 2013. I guess a few uh, 2014 models of uh, cars are starting to come out, and uh, lo and behold, here we have a 2014 version of malware. So uh, there's actually a a uh, piece of malware called uh, Win WebSec, which is basically a um, you know a, a fictitious or you know a, a faux. Um, uh, Computer, antivirus. yeah, antivirus tool. Thank you, Jim. And uh, in this particular case, this is actually an article from uh, Microsoft on their TechNet site. And uh, you know, Microsoft actually is pretty good about getting uh, information out about uh, uh, certainly, you know, this type of thing associated with the Windows environment. So this is a uh, piece of malware that's designed to look like an antivirus tool. Uh, it's designed to make it look like it's actually helping you fix uh, malicious uh, activity on your computer. It actually is sort of the source of the malicious activity. And uh, this particular uh, version has come out with sort of a rebranding. So I guess uh, they felt that people were getting too familiar with the, uh, their, their previous versions, and uh, so they're sort of uh, giving it a new face and bringing it back out so they can uh, uh, presumably bamboozle some more feet folks into, uh, into purchasing their stuff. So uh, you want to keep an eye out for that. And um, as we do with uh, many other little uh, scams of this sort. And uh, so let's go ahead and pass it over to, uh, to Jim here. And I guess uh, we have more fake stuff to talk about. Is that right? Yeah, uh, this one um, hasn't gotten uh, any press that I'm aware of in in the U.S., but it was uh, pointed out to me by uh, a, a friend on a closed list, uh, Fabio Asolini. Um, apparently, there's a campaign going on in uh, targeting the Brazilians. Uh, it's um, using um, Google AdWords and search engine optimization poisoning. You know, techniques we've talked about on this show in the past um, that uh, is using is being used to feed um, fake Skype installers. Uh, in this case, um, there are 
three or four of them that have been detected so far. They're actually hiding their malware on SourceForge. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. You know, there's a new place that the bad guys seem to be hiding their stuff, and I, I believe that they're getting those shut down as we speak. But um, uh, yeah, basically, it, it pretends to be an installer for a new version of Skype, and in the background drops a, a banking uh, Trojan. You know, um, so, uh, just, I, I mean, the biggest takeaway for me from this was, you know, don't use, don't use Google to go find your installers if you're going to install something like Skype, you know, go to the source, go to, go to Microsoft, um, and, and get it from the original source, but, yeah, anyway, so it's, uh, it's another of the campaigns we've seen in the past that are using search engine poisoning and, uh, you know, fake installers on SourceForge, in this case, as I said, to install a Brazilian banking Trojan. I think, Jim, it's interesting to note that they're using the reputation of SourceForge to uh, get you to probably go ahead, download, and, and actually double-click on the executable. And it actually reminds me of some other stories I read recently where they do talk about um, using uh, these established service providers like Dropbox or SourceForge uh, to uh, distribute malware. Uh, and people know the reputation of these services is really high, um, and they may assume that they can just download uh, and install anything from there. But, uh, you know, danger lies ahead. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Do you happen to know what platform this was targeting? Uh, it was targeting Windows. Targeting uh, Windows, okay. Because, you know, uh, Skype is owned by, by Microsoft, and uh, there is a uh, there is some press, and, you know, we'll share the link here related to uh, warning of uh, Skype malware app on Android. So uh, perhaps they're going after multiple, uh, you know, multiple targets associated with this. And uh, I thought that you would have mentioned it, you know, specifically for Android if that was the case. But it looks like there may be, uh, there may be multiple platforms that they're targeting. This could be different, you know, independent activities that are going on. But, you know, I thought it was very uh, insightful that, uh, you know, don't use Google. At, you know, I happen to use Google oftentimes to look for where to get applications, but you will at least take a very close look at where you're going and uh, go to the original sources you suggested for, uh, for getting access to applications. And, of course, we've uh, said many times before to uh, stay with the mainstream uh, app markets for the mobile devices. Yeah, I, I believe these are two different campaigns. The, the malicious Skype on Android is, is different from this one. But, yeah, Skype's a popular target uh, because, you know, a lot of people like to use it to communicate with their friends and relatives who are a ways away. I, you know, I've got friends who use it on a regular basis to talk to their kids that are deployed in Afghanistan. So. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, actually, I should point out that um, I'm just noticing now that the article I was looking at was uh, from some time ago. So uh, we'll stick with your, your side of the story here, targeting <laughs> Windows uh, platform for the moment. Okay. And uh, so, Stan, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, password strength. You know, I have uh, a very difficult time remembering my passwords. In fact, I have so many of them that, uh, well, I, I'm forever having to reset passwords. So do you have a few tips for us? Well, uh, I read an article in Ars Technica that was published earlier this month, and uh, what they did is they took um, basically a sampling of, of five industry leaders and asked them what they do for their password management strategy. And like you and like me and probably most of us, you know, they have so many passwords, it's basically a struggle to uh, keep them all in, in the head. So four out of the five experts um, actually use password management tools, and they generate really complicated passwords um, and then use these um, password managers um, to figure out, uh, to recall what the passwords are. And actually, I guess, in actuality, they probably don't know any of their passwords, right, because they're just store in these managers, and it could be as complex as, as they have to be. Um, one of the uh, uh, experts 
uh, Jeremiah Grossman, he says that uh, in, instead of using a, a password management tool, he actually uses a, a USB key that has an encrypted uh, partition and it's encrypted all over. Uh, and inside of there, there is a text file which has all his passwords. He carries that key with him. I, I guess he probably protects it as much as his password or, or something like that, possibly even more. Um, and whenever he needs it, he plugs it in and copies and pastes his password um, into the appropriate fields. Um, and this, this probably helps him manage his passwords. Um, the other three guys, uh, uh, one of whom is Bruce Schneier, they use three different types of password management tools. And, and those password management tools, they have their different strengths and weaknesses um, in terms of being able to be used across different platforms and how they probably secure the passwords or where in the cloud they're stored. Um, only one of the experts, Adriel Dusatels, um, he, he doesn't do that. He likes to remember his passwords. And then uh, he also says uh, he uses proximity tokens. And one of the uh, reasons that's given for obviously not using a password management, that one that possibly stores everything in the cloud, you know, that's one location where you're kind of putting all your eggs in one basket. And um, it's possible, very feasible, pro feasible and possible that these could be services, these applications could potentially be compromised, and potentially all of your passwords would be exposed all in one go, and no matter how complicated they are. Um, but uh, it's still a strategy for managing all of those complicated things. Um, so this always reminds me of a comic on xkcd.com, um, which we're ha we have the link, and we encourage you to uh, check it out. Uh, it shows you. Uh, <laughs> I guess uh, uh, comically how um, hard, uh, if you use just a, a password with a, a bunch of characters and numbers, it's actually easy for a password cracker to guess them. Uh, and uh, if you use a passphrase, uh, which is much longer, it has words in it, um, possibly spaces, it actually becomes a lot harder uh, to brute force that type of password. And it's a nice comic. I think it gets straight to the point. And for all of you guys who enjoy XKCD, this is a great one to check out. It's an old one, but uh, still my favorite. I uh, definitely, whenever anybody asks me anything about passwords, I uh, send them this comic. Yeah, I guess the one drawback of that that I've seen, Stan, is that uh, I have a difficult time typing four characters without a mistake, let alone 14 characters without a mistake. And uh, so long as those characters are masked, I can go over and over and over again and still not know which one I made a mistake on. But that's a hey, that's my little quirk. And uh, so, I, but I agree with you certainly that the um, you know the strength of the password certainly is much better. And in fact, uh, you know perhaps uh, contradicting myself a little bit here, typing words is probably much more natural or more likely to be correct than uh, typing some crazy sequence of characters and with uh, a bunch of shifts and, and odd twists of the finger involved. So uh, I uh, very much appreciate that. In fact, I was a little surprised to find how many folks are using password managers because in the end you're really uh, you know trusting another piece of software to uh, basically keep those things protected. And certainly when you're not using it, it's probably well encrypted and protected, but uh, I would think that it would be potentially vulnerable if the, uh, if the platform itself is compromised. So, um, again, a little surprised to see that myself. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's something to think about, especially for password managers that have the feature of being able to paste the password in automatically into the application that you use. That means they have a way to you know, even if it's stored encrypted to somehow unencrypt it uh, into memory, and, and there it is in memory. And another alarming thing for me um, as a malware uh, reverse engineer is that potentially how are they, how do they know, uh, you know, which window to paste the password in? Uh, if they implement that mechanism incorrectly, a malicious uh, application may be able to trick uh, uh, the password management utility uh, to put the password into the wrong uh, input box. Uh, that, that, that is something to, to definitely think about. And to your point about uh, having words, uh, long words in, in the password, uh, actually one of the um, experts, Jeffrey Goldberg, uh, he had this one tip. He said that when he picks words, 
uh, he makes sure to misspell at least one. Uh, so it can't be used from a dictionary attack, um, I'm guessing. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, I, I, I'm going to just close this off by saying that my favorite is still these little token devices. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I see is very valuable about something like this is that when I lose something like this, I can pretty much know that I've lost it, that it's not in my possession any longer. And uh, I think that's a very valuable attribute of any of these circumstances, that is, this is uh, changing my, you know, password effectively every minute. Uh, some cases are set up for 30 seconds. And uh, so that it really does close the window in terms of opportunity um, I'm a little uh, disappointed that they aren't more readily in use uh, across the industry, that is, most user accounts don't uh, really support these, science, these things outside of a, uh, you know, a large business enterprise. But, um, you know. Yeah, well, and to add, to add on to that real quickly, um, you know, the, the Google Authenticator, um, they're, they're two-factor thing. You can actually set up your own um, Using their infrastructure, uh, so and their app, but you know not actually their authenticator it, itself. Um, so I've used that in in uh, one place, and like like the token, if if my phone is missing, I'm going to know it. So right, right. So uh, I'm actually looking forward to having some uh, some of the phone devices actually built in some hardware-based support for either protecting passwords or, uh, or generating passwords, you know, one-time passwords. Um, I think to the, I'm not aware of any devices that actually support it in a hardware way at this point. It's all a, a software-based thing, which, um, you know, I think it's a matter of time before uh, some avenues are found to, uh, to get to those. Uh, so with that, uh, Jim, can you tell us a little bit more about um, some of the malware and some of the tricks they're up to to try to mask <laughs> their activities? Yeah, I, uh, I came across this story on F-Secure's blog um, yesterday. It may have been posted a day or two earlier, but um, we've, we've talked in the past about um, some of the uh, Windows malware that uses the uh, right to left uh, Overwrite, you know, changing changing fonts in the middle of it to to back over and overwrite the file extensions to try to hide, uh, you know, hide malicious things as a different type of document or uh, whatever. Um, and the the folks at F Secure noticed that um, uploaded to Virus Total last Friday was a sample that does the same thing on the Mac. Um, now, uh, on the Mac, things are a, a little different in that if you uh, if you open up a Finder window, you know, for the folder where the document is located, it'll actually show you both extensions. Um, but uh, you know, I, I thought it was interesting this trick that we've been seeing of the left to right or right to left overwrite. Um, we've been seeing it in Windows malware for at least a year or so, and now they're uh, trying it on the Mac as well. Right, and uh, I guess uh, just as a little reminder, this is one of the features to be able to support multiple languages, where some languages you read from right to left, and uh, what they're doing is basically shifting in the middle so that they're actually uh, kind of overwriting some of the characters and the file name in this case to make it look like it has an extension that would be innocuous, you know, I think in the example here, they're showing a PDF file, uh, but in fact, it has the extension of an application. So uh, it, very interesting and uh, just another sort of um, uh, example where uh, as there's become more diversity in the types of operating systems being used, we're seeing more diversity in the types of malware that are and the way they're targeting uh, different types of platforms to uh, uh, get at the stuff they're trying to get at. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and take a look at the uh, Internet weather for the last week or so here. And uh, I have a number of things to sort of share with you. I wouldn't call this a particularly active week. Um, it's actually kind of mild weather from the Internet's point of view. But um, uh, let's take a look at some of the activity that's taken place nevertheless. 
Uh, one is we have uh, the first one here is with scan probes on port 8088 TCP. This is actually registered as Radian HTTP. Um, Radian, I think, uh, kind of dates back to basically uh, sort of a, a vendor specific form of HTTP back before it was really kind of uh, fully standardized. I don't think that's really the, uh, the situation right now. Uh, generally, port 8088 has been uh, sort of relegated as a, a proxy port along with port 8080. And so in any case, these, um, the activity that we're seeing here, it's nearly all activity from China. It's just a handful of sources that are uh, conducting this activity. And the most prominent sources are actually also scanning port 8080. So it's a pretty good indication that they're looking for uh, web proxies. One of the other sources that's doing the scanning, I thought it was kind of interesting. It showed up as uh, actually scanning a number of other ports. In fact, on the order of about 150 other ports that, uh, that showed up, ranging from port 80 TTP up to uh, uh, 33,315, uh, is both of them uh, TCP. So there were about 150 ports in between there, or 148 in between there, that were uh, uh, also being scanned by that, uh, that particular address. So again, it's just a handful of sources, but uh, you know, and not particularly uh, aggressive activity, but they certainly are making their rounds around the internet since, uh, well, I guess, about starting on, uh, on July 10th. Uh, next one here is uh, sort of becoming a regular on the program. Uh, it's actually source port activity on port 161 UDP. That's a simple network management protocol. And again, this is associated with, uh, I have a mark here as DNS reflection attacks, but it's actually SNMP reflection attacks, uh, forgive the error. Uh, you know, these SNMP reflection attacks are not as large or frequent as most of the denial of service attacks that we see, uh, but even these attacks are sufficient to disrupt most users. And in fact, uh, you know, some of these spikes are going up around 100, uh, or in, in some cases, in fact, well over 100 megabits per second which uh, most users certainly wouldn't have that amount of bandwidth, so it would be over, overwhelming the uh, network bandwidth that they have available to them. So unless you have a, uh, you know, a, a DDoS protection strategy in place, uh, someone that's supporting you with that uh, mitigation capability, uh, this probably would be disruptive. And I should uh, mention that in, in any case, any of these spikes are at least averaged out across an hour, so the attack may be shorter than an hour, but significantly larger than uh, what's actually shown. Uh, the targets in this particular case vary significantly. So uh, we see uh, lots of short attacks against a variety of different targets, and those uh, vary between consumers as well as uh, co-location providers and chat rooms, uh, which happen to show up in a few examples that I uh, took a look at here. Uh, so a lot of these are what I would describe as nuisance denial of service attacks. They're probably DDoS attack for hire uh, and perhaps associated with uh, gaming activities trying to disrupt the competitor or something of those sorts, which is, uh, you know, kind of a shame that it's gotten to the point where uh, this sort of activity has taken place is, uh, because it would certainly have uh, some disruption for uh, those targets. Uh, next item here is uh, scan probes, basically an increase in the number of probes that we're seeing. In fact, it went from basically nothing to uh, uh, some fairly aggressive activity on port 421 TCP. Um, you know, quite frankly, I don't know what this port gets used for. Uh, it's registered to an application called Arial, which I have not determined what that is exactly. And uh, there wasn't really very much activity on this port prior. Uh, but there certainly has been in the last, uh, oh, I guess it was, a, it was for a fairly short period of time on, the, on July 10th where there was some fairly aggressive scanning activity on that port on the order of about 60 million uh, probes per hour we were seeing at one point uh, associated with this. Now, there were only a couple of sources that were doing this scanning activity. And in fact, uh, in both cases, they were scanning also on port 8080 TCP. So there may be some obscure your sort of proxy tool or something that, uh, that is associated with this particular port that they were looking for. And uh, these sources were also occasionally scanning a couple of other ports as well, but uh, not significant enough to really uh, warrant reporting here. Uh, next one here is uh, basically a revisit from one that we had talked about last week. And uh, I want to thank Brad for his uh, tip here. 
you know, last week I talked about the scan sources and scan probes on port 1998 TCP, and we had talked about it being associated with Cisco X25. Uh, Brad had pointed out that um, X25 is, in fact, still used in packet radio, and uh, it makes a lot of sense because you want to have a, basically a reliable connection between each of the radio relays and make sure it passes through. It slows down the, the uh, data transport, but it makes it more reliable. Uh, you know, in amateur radio, as well as in uh, amateur in support of some types of emergency services, these uh, these systems are in use. So uh, there may be some implications from a security standpoint that you want to be paying attention to that this may be uh, looking for gateways into the radio packet networks that, um, um, you know, may be uh, uh, innocuous, but uh, we'd hate to find out that it's for a malicious intent. So in any case here, there were... Uh, Nearly all the sources associated with this, there were on the order of hundreds of sources associated with this. Um, you know, it's been varying, but uh, not significantly, varying in times of day, but uh, not varying significantly over time here. Uh, this activity is continuing, and um, I have this, uh, again, a little typo here. It says ratio gateways of the radio gateways that they'd be looking for. Uh, next item here is scan probes on port 1723 TCP, and this would be um, uh, basically a point-to-point -point, uh, protocol. Um, I think this is a peer-to-peer -peer transfer protocol, actually, P2P, PPTP, and uh, also on 1080 TCP that's associated with SOC. So the, basically what I'm uh, pointing out here is that uh, we have a single source from China that's actually uh, been fairly aggressive at scanning on both of these ports at the same time. So I went ahead and combined these, and you can see here the uh, timeline that's associated with this. This is, again, on July 10th, we had this activity where they were pro uh, probing on both of those. So uh, 1723 is not one that was particularly familiar to me, but it's, um, again, a point-to-point -point or a peer-to-peer -peer tunneling protocol, uh, which would be along the lines of the same type of thing that, uh, that SOX provides as well. Uh, looking at the 10 most probed ports for the last, uh, actually from yesterday, uh, there aren't any real surprise. Well, actually, there's one little bit of a surprise here. Uh, first of all, port 445 at the top of the list, port 53 UDP next in line, port 8080 TCP, which we've talked about, is, is, uh, is on the list here, uh, 1433 TCP. This is associated with uh, Microsoft SQL database. Port 3389, which is associated with remote desktop computing. Uh, port 80 TCP, uh, looking for likely web servers, potentially for the uh, purpose of compromise. And the little surprise here is actually port 135 TCP, which is uh, basically uh, dates back to some of the older um, uh, Microsoft um, uh, NetBIOS uh, exploits that existed in the past. And uh, it, it basically come off the radar for a significant period of time. For some reason, it's come back onto the radar here. So uh, there was some reasonable number of probes on that uh, particular port yesterday for some reason. And the next item here is uh, most sources doing the probing. And uh, port 445 is well at the top with almost, uh, it's actually a little over a quarter, perhaps 30% of the probes. And uh, or sources doing the probing, I should say. And then others that are notable are port 23 TCP and port 80 TCP, which have uh, a reasonable number of sources doing the probing, as well as port 3389 TCP. And as usual, we still see the peer-to-peer uh, -peer activity associated with the zero access botnet shown up here on port 16470, port 16471, port 16464. And normally we have port 16465 showing up on here as well. Uh, but uh, it didn't make the grade today. And last year we have the uh, daily reconnaissance index, and I think last week we had reported sort of a spike in activity, and I think uh, similar to the way the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average took a little bit of a dip near the end of June and uh, basically recovered from that. Uh, this is a similar situation where it seems like the, uh, the amount of reconnaissance activity we've seen over the last week has uh, dropped back down again to... Uh, to something that uh, looks like it's more on the downward trajectory, trajectory that we've seen earlier. 
so I, I wanted to uh, share a little bit of a thought for the day. Um, and I think uh, this is probably uh, fairly pertinent to a lot of organizations that are perhaps overlooking some things that uh, I think are pretty important from a security point of view. Um, you know, in the uh, CISSP studies, for example, uh, they talk about a triad, a triad of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And uh, I think it's uh, all too often overlooked that is the, uh, we get focused on confidentiality and integrity when we talk about security, but availability is one that you want to pay a lot of attention to as well. And in fact, what really happens is when you get to the choices that you have to make from a security standpoint, you're really making a decision between uh, the trade-offs between confidentiality and availability uh, in many cases, and, and integrity being a, a portion of that as well. So to put it in sort of an extreme example, if you really want to be able to manage availability of services, uh, what you might want to do is have no passwords on those systems. That makes it more available, more accessible to users. They don't have to worry about having forgotten their passwords. You don't have to worry about recovering those. Uh, you don't have to worry about the delay. It would, it would be associated with uh, recovering those passwords. But it certainly would be creating a weakness from the point of view of uh, managing the integrity and the confidentiality of the data that's associated with that system. So that's uh, obviously a, not a practical example, but it's certainly one that you want to keep in mind that is uh, there are trade-offs uh, between those things. And, you know, one of the observations that uh, came about recently in an exercise we were doing was that uh, the SAMS top 20 critical controls doesn't really take into account uh, availability very much. It's very focused on confidentiality and integrity, and there's a little bit about, you know, business continuity and being able to recover data, but not much in the uh, in terms of the trade-offs associated with uh, making sure availability is there. So I just wanted to at least share that point with you and uh, make sure that uh, when you're thinking about your security strategy, that it's not just about um, controlling access to systems, but also making sure those systems are available. Yeah, Brian, and that reminds me of the typewriter story. Uh, you know, the information is secure and it's, uh, it's uh, authenticated, but it's not available for sharing, and which might be okay if that's if those are your requirements. Uh, but have even a simple story about the typewriter, I think, uh, kind of shows the tension between this triad, the items in this triad. Yeah, absolutely, Stan. And, uh, and perhaps availability could be improved if you have enough carrier pigeons available. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so on on that light note here, that's the show for today. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with us, uh, we certainly welcome your comments, your feedback, and once again, thank you, Brad, Brad for your feedback. On uh, You can reach us at threattrack at list.atg.com. Uh, you can also find us on Twitter, so if you'd like to, uh, to send us something, our handle is uh, at threattrack. Uh, threattrack video is available on the uh, ATT Tech channel. That's att.com slash threattrack. It's also available on YouTube, uh, and you can subscribe subscribe to an audio-only version on iTunes as well. So uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, thanks, Jim and Stan, for your contributions. I very much appreciate it. And uh, we'll be back next week with a new episode. And until then, keep your network safe.